Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being with us. I hope you're enjoying Bangkok as much as we are. Um, so I'm a bit biased here. This is my favorite panel of the entire conference. For those of you who know me, I'm Magali from the FIDI office, and I am known as the sustainability crazy lady, a bit the one that switches off the light when she comes into the office. Um, <laughs> before I introduce our, our panel, I just quickly want to give a bit of background information to why this topic has become really, really important for FIDI and for the industry. But first off, a bit of a disclaimer. Um, we are going to focus mainly on environmental sustainability today, which doesn't mean that the social and the governance aspect of the topic are not considered important. Um, we, in the, the many conversations that we've had over the past two years, we have come to the conclusion that because we work in a very global environment, it is easier to come to um, agreements on what environmental sustainability is, um, when you can start talking about social aspects or governance aspects, it can become very, very tricky and very, very complicated. Um, so for the moment, we are going to focus on mainly uh, env environmental sustainability, but we will touch upon the other, other sides of sustainability as well. Second disclaimer is this is not an educational session. So you will not learn the differences between scope one, scope two, scope three. Uh, you will not learn how to become more sustainable as a business immediately. For that, uh, I invite you to take uh, the, the, an, um, a copy of the latest FIDI Focus magazine lying mm -hmm. in the networking lounge, uh, or go to the FIDI Academy training, um, online training module, which uh, is for free, as Derek said, and which it covers the topic extensively. The purpose of today's session really is to define what we as the global mobility industry should be doing to work towards a more sustainable way of doing business. And we as the global mobility industry, that means the moving industry, that means DSP, that means the RMCs level, that means the uh, end customer, it means the association, and it means the entire industry together. Now, just before we start with the conversation, I just want to give some background info, um, information on the Coalition for Green Mobility, which probably, I hope, most of you have heard about. Um, <clears throat> so, at Infidi, we've been looking at what sustainability means for our, our industry for about the last two and a half, maybe three years. And we came to the conclusion that it was a topic that everybody was grappling with. Everybody understood that it was important for their businesses, but no one really knew what it meant, no one really knew what they needed to do, and no one really knew how it linked together with the other stakeholders in our industry. So last year at our FIDI conference in Cannes, we invited RMCs, we invited corporate customers, we invited our sister associations to sit around a table and discuss, okay, what does sustainability mean for us and what should we be doing? And of course the, the, the resounding uh, agreement that came out of it was, we are in this together. We cannot approach it uh, from a siloed uh, perspective. We really needed to understand how we all work together on this, right? The immediate result of, of, of that conversation, other conversations we've been having, was that six associations came together and decided to tackle this topic together. So we have the FIDI, we have IAM, Eura, the Worldwide um, Employee Relocation Council, so WERC, the Canadian um, ERC, uh, and CHPA, so that's the Corporate Housing. So these six associations have, been com have come together since July on a weekly basis to try and figure out, okay, what the hell are we supposed to do? And because we did kind of figure out that this was a topic so big that we, could not, we couldn't do it alone, we ran an RFP to find an external consultant to help us define the industry roadmap towards sustainability. Um, the, chosen, uh, the chosen consultant was Deloitte, who started in September, uh, running surveys, interviews, and then a full day lab session with a group of, of individuals uh, to identify what are the pain points for each sector and the industry as a whole, and what should, what should the immediate and long-term priorities be for our industry to really make sure that whatever we do to, to work towards a sustainable way of doing business actually makes sense. So uh, Deloitte presented the roadmap 
project or result to the association leaders in December. Uh, the, six, the six association leaders did an online presentation for the membership and the general public in February, which I invite you to, uh, to look at, to, to watch on, um, on Vimeo when you, when, you, when you get the time. And now we are at this very, very difficult moment of, okay, we have a very big momentum growing. We have this enthusiasm, but now we need to go from uh, a, big, uh, a big will of wanting to do stuff to actually doing it. And that's the tricky part. And that's why we've invited this panel of, of, um, of experts in their own field to try and, uh, try and understand what should we individually what should we as stakeholders in this broad industry of ours do to actually make this work? So I'll, we'll start off with a quick round of presentations. Um, I'll, I suggest that we start with Sebastian and we run down the line. Mm -hmm. So I'm Sebastian Laporta, Managing Director of World Alliance in Chile. My name is Jessica Deutschmann. I'm with Goslin um, in Europe. Good morning. My name is Bill Grable. I serve as the Chair and CEO of the Grable Companies. Uh, good morning, Mark Birchall with Suddeth and Sterling. I'm also a board member of the ERC. Uh, good morning, I'm Tadza Linden, CEO of Eura. Oh, by the way, thank you for doing this at a more reasonable time of day. <laughs> I seem to remember we did one of those recordings at five o'clock in the morning. Well, yeah. that's one of the problems or the challenges of working with a very, very global membership. Yeah, exactly. right. yeah, where we can listen a little bit in the future. Mike? Can we have more return for the audience, for the panelists, please? Um, so, okay, we said that this was not going to be a, um, a an educational session, but just to bring this very complex topic of sustainability home to us. Can um, I'll just ask you quickly, what are you you doing in your individual companies with regards to sustainability? And I'll start with you, Jessica. Uh, what is Gosland doing uh, with regards to sustainability? Well, there are a lot of projects ongoing, um, but just to name a some uh, or to name some, um, we started with a um, focus cluster on sustainability actually already a couple years back, about five years ago, um, and that was came from within. Um, I think the most important is that it needs to come top down. So in your company, really, the CEO needs to believe in in the topic and making that change. Um, and luckily at Gosman we do have um, such CEO and we have the shareholder that does believe in making the change um, and going down a, a greener route. Um, what we're doing is really we're looking at collaborating. So um, we have built um, a framework on three pillars, which is about uh, well governance, the reporting part of it. Um, then it's all about innovation and education, education from within. So it's also about a culture, like really implementing this into the culture of Goslin. Um, just to name a couple of things of what we do, is really to look how can we collaborate with other um, movers within our, um, within Belgium, for example, to um, co-load um, freight, to um, make sure we have um, a project ongoing to, um, go with electric vehicles um, into a couple of cities in um, Belgium. Um, just to make sure, you know, we're kind of looking at what we can do together because we strongly believe that it's all about collaborating when you really want to succeed in becoming greener. And Sebastian, what about you in Chile? Yeah, so uh, World Online for several years uh, has been doing um, uh, sustainability projects and social responsibility projects, but uh, never formalize it. So since one year we, we formalize the process and uh, give uh, the responsibility to one management in the company. And from them we, 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 we called also a, a special, special consultant uh, um, person to help us to uh, measure the, ha the, the carbon footprint. And from there we started to build uh, uh, the basics, right, uh, measure, uh, objectives, clear measure, clear objectives, and and start to 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 make our path uh, in in this new sustainability uh, world, um, and also uh, as the demand from from the different stakeholders starts to increase in terms of asking how we were doing in sustainability, we started to search uh, uh, to all the worldwide certification 
companies that are, that are all around and uh, we are also starting the EcoBodies uh, certification. And in more specific details on what we are doing, uh, we, we are developing um, a recycle and reusable box uh, process. Uh, we have been recycling for many years, but now, as, as I said before, at the beginning, we are setting clear goals for that, uh, clear objectives, uh, uh, educating our people, educating our clients, and educating our, our agents. Uh, and I can explain later a little bit more on how, how is this project. Uh, also in terms of energy, we, we change all the, uh, the lights from, from the, from our facilities and, and we reduce in 80% our, our consumption uh, using only LEDs. Mm -hmm. uh, and also we, we got a certification from our, the energy company in Chile, which give you um, uh, the proof that uh, all the uh, energy that we consume is uh, originally from 100% uh, renewable energy. Um, and also we are checking the supply chain like scope one, uh, analyzing uh, 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 and asking to our paper providers to give us their certificates on sustainability because in the paper uh, industry the sustainability is uh, really uh, uh, an important issue and uh, it's, very, it's much more developed than in our industry. So uh, we are checking also that. And, and as uh, uh, Jessica says also, we are educating a lot our, our employees, uh, our people, our uh, coming from, from the owners, uh, which is the most important thing, you know, from the ownership, bringing down uh, through all the floor chart uh, and the importance <coughs> of, uh, of uh, being sustainable. So, I'm <coughs> sorry, Mark and, I'm sorry. <coughs> Um, when you, when you um, tackle sustainability, when you are a big group, looking at studying Lexicon and Sudduth, you have the additional challenge of having to manage um, sustainability throughout a wide variety of companies that are part of your group, but then also an even wider uh, supply chain. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that at group level? Yeah, so we, uh, about two years ago, um, engaged with a consultant uh, that came in and sort of looked at the different businesses. And you're exactly right, it's difficult when you've got such a, a broad, you know, from South Africa to India, China, uh, footprint of, of people. But we, we did a couple of things. We signed also into the EcoVardis program. And uh, it's fair to say that our European entities are further forward than perhaps the rest of the parts of our business. <coughs> but then we also decided that while we had that formal framework, we sort of moved it into a more practical um, channel and said, okay, let's break it down to people, teams, and the business. Uh, because what we realized was, um, and, and we're fully behind, not just as a FIDI member of the coalition, but as a ERC board member, the participation in the coalition, we can't wait for that. Uh, and at a very practical level, focusing on the people, we encourage people to say, you can make a difference today. You don't have to wait for a program. Um, you don't have to sign in for the, the bigger you know, UN compact. You as an individual can make strides based on turning off the lights, how you commute to work, what you do in terms of getting rid of paper. And just um, then we kind of worked it up through the business all the way to giving uh, paid time off. Uh, to encourage people to clean up litter from the beach or go down to the river and take trash out of the river. So we tried to do it at multiple levels and we were conscious of the fact we didn't want to just uh, sign in for these programs and let the program drive what we did. We wanted to put it back in the hands of the employees. And again, because I think part of what we deal with it is in these different parts of the world, uh, it's got to be relevant, uh, proportionate, uh, and practical, and they're all different. And you know, governments have different regulations, so it's tough to do one quick peanut butter spread of everyone has to commit to this. We, that's why we're trying to break it down to the people level. So, keeping it practical is, is is really complicated when you only have one company to manage. So, when you have a group, is even more difficult. But at an RMC level, how do you keep it practical? knowing that the actual bulk of emissions and the bulk of the impact actually lies way down downstream 
How, do, how does Grable manage that? Well, it really began with <clears throat> establishing some baselines of first trying to determine on an end-to-end -end basis how much carbon is produced um, in a given relocation and whether that's relative to a destination service provider, a mover, a pet transport, or whatever the case might be. So on average, we've, we've been able to work with some consultants to kind of determine um, what those respective categories um, have generated. And then with that, we've, um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, probably 80% of our accountable emissions come through the scope three, which is a function of the services that our uh, supplier networks provide. So we first developed a policy and then we started to share some of the objectives of, of what we were trying to accomplish. And then we've created a, a group called our Sustainable Partner Program. And we believe we've kind of identified where about 80% of what would be our scope three emissions um, are generated. And so we're working very closely and it's part sharing knowledge of what um, we have um, gleaned out of the marketplace in terms of how you benchmark, how you measure, what are best practices. Um, and then with those 80 or so uh, sustainability partners, um, are now collaborating and uh, figuring out how can we reduce, you know, whether it's uh, carbon emissions, uh, corrugate waste, uh, reduce water. Um, and so it's really a, a fertile dialogue mm -hmm. that is constantly occurring. And uh, what I think is just awesome is the fact that the coalition is helping get out in front of some of the reporting. Um, because if we as an industry don't take the lead, we're going to have somebody impose it upon us. And we're so far down the, the priority list of these major global companies, um, we don't want them to invent, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, requirements that they have no context. And so I think it's great that we're, as, as a combined industry with the five associations represented, um, taking the lead and hopefully we will very quickly come up and say, hey, this is a first generation establishment of, of standards and measures and targets. And now is whether EY or whoever is appointed to, you know, audit, verify and authenticate uh, performance going forward, that at least they don't have to start from ground zero. We have a template. And then over time, if, if better insights, better knowledge uh, say, okay, those things need to be refined. Great, at least we've been at the forefront and are the pioneers in, in creating that kind of ground floor um, baseline, if you will. So that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I think Tad will back me up on this. When we, when we discuss sustainability on an industry level, um, we all agree that yes, uh, we are in this together. Yes, we need to tackle it all. But once you go down, to the nitty gritty details of what needs to be done, we come up with a long list of pain points which, is, which we don't right now know exactly how we, how we can overcome uh, individually as associations or companies. So um, I'll start with you, Mark. Uh, according to you, from an industry point of view, what are the main pain points that um, hinder us from uh, doing this in a coordinated and actually meaningful way? Well, I think there's a few elements uh, Governments will be the starting point. Um, you know, different governments uh, from a political cycle, you know, in the US it's a four year term. Uh, so different, um, you know, political parties come in with different agendas and, and what is the priority. And then from that drives different regulations across different countries and, and again, what's the prioritization uh, of the, the green initiatives within the party that is in power has a huge bearing. And, and we all start um, at different places. You know, we've been fortunate. I'm sure many of us have gone on tours around this wonderful city. And, you know, what you see in terms of the environmental impact of, of some trash is very different than the city where I live and what's important to us. So you've got this huge regional, geograph geographic, political um, uh, kind of variants. So it's going to be incredibly difficult, I think, to draw one single baseline under all of that. But having said that, you've got to make a start. And that's why I think, uh, echo what Bill said, and from our perspective, it comes down to individual people can make a difference. You don't have to wait for your government to tell you what the regulations are. You don't have to wait for a target for 2030. 
uh, to make an impact. So I think for me, we, we've got to be careful not to end up in a period of inertia because we're all stuck by different government rules and regulations and priorities. We've got to take the responsibility and the ownership. I like what Bill said about not waiting for the customers to dictate to us you know, what we should be doing. So I think the quicker, without putting pressure on the organizations that we all represent, that we can come up with at least the framework to start from uh, will be a start. But I think the biggest uh, roadblock is going to be the geopolitical uh, impact that the kind of world economy has on, on what's a priority, what's important to people, as well as then the kind of socio-economic factors that are underpinned in that relationship. And Sebastian, from a more supplier point of view, what do you think is the, the biggest hurdle for you as a company uh, to develop your own sustainability strategy, knowing that when we talk about sustainability, it's not only uh, environmental, social, governance sustainability, but also talking about business sustainability? Mm -hmm. So, high cost. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, in order to comply with uh, all the sustainability demands, uh, we will have to invest a lot of money in this journey. Uh, and that means uh, maybe uh, in, that we will have to increase our costs, or increase our prices. And, and that comes with uh, consumer demands. So our clients are able to uh, uh, accept a greener move. Are they able to accept a higher cost that uh, the RMCs are uh, uh, pressured by their clients? Uh, uh, uh. So that is, that is the question that I, that I am asking myself, right? Uh, uh, on top of the standardization that is, is not there, that is very hard, and on top of the fragmentation that, that, that all uh, the, the workflow of a move involves, uh, from a packing material, from a moving company, from a, a steep shipping line, air shipping line, agents around the world, RMCs, uh, I think uh, is something that we have to analyze. And, and, and we have to change also our minds that uh, um, Sustainability doesn't mean also higher cost. We can we can we can start from scratch, and and, and it's a saving cost also. Mm. Um, we have to consider that having a good sustainability will bring us uh, saving cost. And Jessica, what do you think, um, or how how could how would you like the industry through the coalition um, help you in your company? Uh, drive this forward in a, in, a, in a real and useful way? Well, I think we, um, there are already a uh, very important point mentioned um, from Mark and Sebastian about build, like building, the, giving a foundation, like where to start. I think for smaller companies, definitely difficult to kind of like find the little thread on where to start. Um, but it's, it, it can be the little things. It can be the little things you do every day. Um, and then go from there. I think it's important to have um, a goal, a strategic goal where you want to go. Um, but then coming back to what Sebastian just said um, about like making it a green and move, I think we are used to a very, um, like a, a system within the moving industry or mobility industry. And just um, specific clients that you work with, they have the idea um, of how they want their mobility program and the moves that are happening to be handled um, and coming back to collaborating maybe it's for it's time that the sales team really understand what other options there are thinking outside of the box like do we really always need to have all new packing material do we really need to have our own shipment can there be more flexibility in transit time if we're combining shipments if we're using groupage if we're consolidating um, so that's the question, right? But then the sales teams need to be smarter to really, if you have the opportunity to talk to a client, to explain, okay, you want to do something about sustainability? Our partners and our supply chain actually offer those options. Um, so I think that's coming back to that collaborating part, and I think Brable's done a great um, step forward in having their sustainability partners. Um, just to kind of bounce ideas, but also understand what the movers or smaller companies can do um, and what options there are on the market. So, Tad, back to what Jessica just said, one of the main priorities that was identified by Deloitte um, in, during the, the Roadmap project was education and awareness, 
right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> according to you, from a DSP point of view, but also like a global industry point of view, what priority, what are the immediate short-term and long-term priorities that we as an industry should work on? Well, we basically got to look at, look at it from the bottom up, really, because the, the very small companies, um, one or two, three people working together, they haven't got time to even think about what to do to be sustainable. So we've got to start from the very beginning. And I think what came out of that uh, roadmap was that the reality of the situation was that all the things that needed to be looked at and examined and maybe changed or improved were all the things that we sitting here are doing, um, which was a bit of a shock to begin with. Apparently, uh, consulting is not something you have to worry about, so Deloitte are okay. The rest of us <laughs> have to do the work. <laughs> um, so. In a sense, we, 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 we took that and we sat back. And as, uh, 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 as, a, as a coalition, um, we've come up with a, a five-point plan, um, which uh, starts with five different tracks, which I have to say, I'm stealing this all from Magali. She wrote the paper. <laughs> um, but the tracks are basically, number one, education and awareness. We need to tell the people at the bottom I don't mean it in that way, but at the bottom of the chain, um, you know, we can help you, and, and this is what you need to know, and this is what you need to think about. We also looked at <laughs> defining greener mobility, because uh, Grable are defining greener mobility in their way, Sudath are doing it their way, and you are also, everyone's doing it their own way. So we need something which is across the board. And we don't just mean uh, DSP or moving or corporate housing. We mean the whole global mobility uh, as a group. And as a group, we're much, much louder. I mean, uh, as individual associations, we're just like this compared to the rest of the world. As a group, we're more like that. So we might actually get heard because in reality, we are a very <coughs> small cog a very important small cog in a very big wheel. So we need to define what it is that we're talking about. And one of the first stops on that journey is to create a glossary of terms. Because we need, everyone needs to agree on, on, on what is defined as what. And I can give you a really simple example. If you're in the UK and you say to somebody, the mobility industry <coughs> automatically assume you're talking about walking sticks, wheelchairs, <laughs> and various other devices to help people who are disabled. Whereas to the rest of the world, mobility is relocation. So we need to define what's what and where's where. We also need to drill down into the various different um, activities like DSPs, corporate housing, moving, and work out what's good for those individual groups in order to come up with something. Now, th there's no way that once a week for an hour, the six associations are gonna do this on their own. We can't. So we need to work with our members and we need our members' support. We're not gonna do this unless the members actually want it because otherwise we're wasting their time and ours. I, I believe that the membership want this, so I believe that this is the right route to go down. Um, and we, we need to, to get this thing moving, but we can't do it alone. And there are other organizations out there, smaller, more national associations, um, maybe even corporations, who we want to encourage to be part of all this in order that we can do a proper job to serve the whole global mo mobility industry. And I think at this moment, I mean, we have a couple of other tracks. We have CO2 measurement um, and also some sort of certification. And the other one we actually have is governance because this coalition cannot actually exist without it being something. So we're looking into creating um, some kind of not-for-profit which will actually sit over the six associations and other organizations can come and then join in because, and by the way, gentlemen, checkbook's out. <laughs> <laughs>
we can't do this without money. I think Chuck appreciated that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, I, I'm not suggesting we're going to go out there and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars where it's not necessary, but it may be necessary, and we need to get people to help us fund this. So, and I think one one key aspect of this whole conversation as well is the buy-in of key yeah. key stakeholders, and one of the key stakeholders being the client. Mm. Yeah. So of course, at the end of the day, it's the client who pays for our services, it's the client who just dictates as well what they want and what they're willing to pay for. But we are the specialists. We know what goes into an international move. We know what goes into a DSP. The problem being that often we are not in contact with the client until everything has been signed already. So how can we, as in we all, drive this conversation up to the client level and get the client to actually understand and accept a change of business as usual. How will we do that? I don't think we have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. I think the clients are all over it, and they're all over it because they have conscientious investors, and the mindset of what defines goodness and what defines value uh, from an investor point of view um, is evolving where it does embrace sustainability and it does embrace not just the environmental but the social and then the governance is a really important part of that because unless you have you know legitimate reporting and authenticated results you're you run the risk of greenwashing and then or you know i use this term i don't know if it's right but on the s you know woman washing or race washing or disability washing and uh, probably one of the worst things you can do reputationally is be discoverable as having greenwashed or disability washed or, or whatever the case might be. So um, at the risk of being edgy here, first of all, I would like to applaud the people who have chosen to attend this session. Because you know, in reality, you only represent about 20% of the total attendees of this conference. And then compared to the entire association, you know, this maybe represents 10%. I, I don't know the exact numbers, right? And I feel like we're preaching to the choir up here. So if anything, as a takeaway, I would suggest you and I and all of us together need to start having these dialogues with the other 80% of the conference attendees who aren't in this darn session today and the rest of the membership who thinks, hey, man, that's not for me. Because uh, one more moment, Magali, and then I'll let you move on. How many of you have seen the Harry Potter movie or movies, right? Generally, all of us have. And in the very first movie, they, Harry goes through this thing called the sorting hat, right? And they put this hat on him and they determine really what's his soul, what's his personality, and what's his destiny in life. And, you know, there's, in the supply chain, there are all sorts of people who put that hat on and they're making conscious decisions to run toward this opportunity or to just sit in the weeds and ignore it. And I believe it's not going to be very long before, if you want to participate serving the world's most valuable public companies with conscientious investors sitting behind them, you're going to have to be a part of their journey. And we are just a part of it. If you're customer-centric, you're doing this not only because it keeps you relatable and relevant for that customer base, but then as an employer, you've got to start looking around and saying, hey, are you going to really have people in their 40s, 30s, and 20s um, wanting to continue to work in your organization if you're just ignoring the realities that are all around us? And so, you know, labor shortage is a huge uh, issue for all of us in any of our industries. And is there a value prop as employers that if we're communicating to them, hey, we're trying to do the right things, we're trying to leave the earth a better place than we found it, um, at the margin, might you be able to attract 5%, 10% more people than you're really connecting with today? You gotta start somewhere, but I believe at least you're gonna be a little more resonant with a certain segment of the workforce, especially going forward. And so it's actually a very interesting point in talking about the, the, the new generation of the workforce. I mean, this has been like one of the main leading topics throughout all the conversations we've had over the past few days is this problem of talent retention and, 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 at, um, and finding people to work for you. So Jessica, from the 39 Club perspective and as representative of this younger workforce, we're moving up, moving up in our industry. Um, <clears throat> what would your message be to the younger uh, audience members, as in how, how, can, how can they actually be an agent of change within their, within their company immediately now? We use your voice, um, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, 
we always see this now this engagement growing within the FIDI39 club, which is great. But just, um, yeah, I think uh, really using your voice. Uh, I think Gen Z is going to be a different generation than uh, millennials, so we are a little bit more quieter than they are. They will ask for things um, if they know how to, but um, it's, it, it will be um, offered them. It's just a standard that you are, the company you work for um, has a sustainability um, goal um, or program. Um, they're at there. It's just something they see as a set thing. And if they come into a moving company where there are still piles of paper, um, I don't think they're going to stay for a long time. <laughs> um, obviously, when you then think about just um, their career development, um, they want to be engaged in things. They want to have a roadmap on where they can go. And if you have that for your younger talent to um, have them engage and focus clusters or um, yeah, sustainability groups. Um, we've seen within Goslin that that's actually drawing people um, or giving them the opportunity to voice what they want to see and just giving them a platform to share their ideas. Mm -hmm. I think that's how you can make sure to give them the, um, the confidence that they are able to let you know what their thoughts are. Mm -hmm. And so back to the social aspect that you just mentioned before, um, Bill, and I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll get to you, Sebastian. So you're based in Chile. Uh, what I often find is that the, the sustainability and the diversity conversation often are very much driven by a, a very US-centric or Western European-centric vision. Um, <clears throat> how can we address the more social aspects of sustainability uh, from a very global perspective without it becoming just lip service to, oh, we have to be very careful because we, we have to be politically correct and we cannot uh, go against cultural, uh, in, or, or cultural differences. So just to give you an example, for example, so I'm French. Uh, when, I, when I read RFPs uh, coming from the US asking to, to state the percentage of race and religion uh, in your company, my skin crawls because in France it is prohibited to ask anybody about their race or their, their religious background. So those are two cultures that we would consider rather similar uh, and that's already like an, an unbridgeable difference. So if you take that to, to a global context, how, how can you get into something productive and pragmatic without creating a real storm of a problem? <laughs> yeah, so, so I think, uh, uh, coming to Bill comment, uh, why we are only 10% of the convention here or less uh, is because we feel that maybe sustainability is too far from our reality. 70% uh, uh, of the members of FIDI are small or medium companies in a very uh, maybe undeveloped continents, uh, different geographies and different realities. So, so uh, my suggestion is that uh, first you have to be uh, and, and, and look inside your company uh, in order to, to sell sustainability, you have to be first ethic, you have to pay well, you have to give health to the, to the employees, basic things, you, know, you have to be professional, uh, you have to give the opportunity to educate the people to, um, to give a good nutrition, you know, basics that maybe for the U.S. and for Europe are obvious, but for our countries, um, if they don't give them the basics, are they able to 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 pack a box and recycle it? Uh, if if I don't have food to <laughs> a proper food, so so starting from scratch, uh, I think that we need to to give them uh, to all our employees, to all our stakeholders, the the some obvious thing that is okay. Are we covering the basics? After the basics, I, I am ready to really, as an owner, come with a, with a message saying, uh, let's go for sustainability and change our mindsets. So, so we, you, all these companies, I think, uh, are afraid because they say, okay, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm covering the, the, the basics. Uh, uh, so, so that is, I think, uh, a path that we need to do and, and, and we can start in our local companies and in our local communities, communities with the very simple things. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's the, the simple way to, okay. to consider. 
from, a, from an association aspect, and, and Tad, maybe you can help me on that one. From an association aspect, how do you drive that conversation forward by making sure that you include all of your stakeholders, but without going against any cultural sensibilities or any preconceived ideas that we might carry without knowing? I think you've got to, uh, you, you, you can't decide that one size fits all because that's my the thing I hate most of all, you know, one size fits all, it's absolute nonsense. Um, I think you've got to, when, when we're looking at uh, how, uh, how, how we do things in order to be, let's take greener for example, as you say, it's a lot easier for a global, to look at globally. You've got to go and look at the different parts of the world. You've got to look, for example, at Africa, at South America. Um, I know this, this is a, 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 probably a very silly example, but um, it, the government told us years ago that we should have diesel cars. Now we're apparently supposed to have electric cars. But if you go, to sub, if you go down to Africa, an electric car, where do you charge it? Um, so for them, it's important that they have modern, uh, modern vehicles which, which put out less greenhouse gases. So you've got to look at it from that perspective. You can't say, right, you've got to have everything electric. And you've got to, to do the same thing across the world. And it goes down to the fact that a lot of these organizations are relatively small. And you've got to help them to move forward as fast as they can within the constraints that they have. And I remember last year in Cannes, when we started talking about this, I said to someone across the room, and the corporates are going to have to pay. They're going to have to put their hands in their pockets and give more money for these services. But thankfully, Bill is encouraging by saying that they have really, in, their, their investors want to be more sustainable. So maybe that's not going to be such a huge problem but we really have to work from the ground up everywhere. So we need to have groups of people in South America telling us what it's like, groups of people in Africa telling us what it's like, groups of people in Asia telling us what's, what it's like. Unfortunately, this whole topic is not like GDPR, where that was just put down and we all had to obey. You know, and that's maybe also the power of associations, yes, because right. we have this global global membership to work with. Yeah. So Mark, you wanted to, to add something to that point? Well, I just think it's uh, how you set this up, in my opinion, is that it's not rules and regulations, yeah. it's a framework. Mm. It, it's an agreement around how you can apply elements of the framework that are relevant, proportionate in the geography that you, you live and work in. And, and if you've got a framework that allows that to go down to the level of individuals and the difference they can make, then we will make a difference. And you know, all the way up to then the sort of regulatory and stakeholder pressure that's sort of the top down that companies are feeling. So I just think we, we as, as FIDI and other organizations, we've got to get the message out there that this is a framework. It's, and, you, and you can work within the framework whether you're a, you know, a large, sophisticated company or RMC like, like Brable, or you're a small two-person DSP, you can still um, thrive adopting elements of the framework that are relevant to you, your business, your markets, and, and the economics of your business. So I, I don't want us to have anyone in the room or the organization come and think, oh, good, I can't get my head around this. The frame, it's, it's a framework approach. That's how I, I feel this should be achieved. That's interesting. So, um, yeah, Magali, to jump on a point that you raised, which is a very sticky point, which is the different interpretations of on the S function, kind of D, E, and I, and then drilling into race or ethnicity or, or what have you. Um, <clears throat> as far as a framework and a place to start, I think one of the great things that the world would generally agree on is should there be a conscious effort to have more equity and representation with respect to women in the workforce? And you know, how can each of us work toward um, having evidences of greater equitability and opportunity um, for women? Um, I think that's a universal factor <clears throat> that, again, transformatively, the world is waking up to. 
And so I know that's not the scope of this conversation, but that's how we look at it. And we're a global employer, and, and it is tricky. You know, it means something different in India than it does in Shanghai, than it does in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but uh, each of those areas, we're consciously trying to help in terms of our uh, employee development processes and opportunity and coaching and mentoring um, to make sure we don't just keep looking for males to populate the managerial and leadership roles in our organization all the way up to our board. Mm -hmm. And um, that takes conscious effort. Thank you. Jesse's already getting really, really worried <laughs> because he knows how I can get very passionate about gender parity topics in our industry. But I think we will keep that for another uh, panel. Um, so before we get on to the, the questions, um, so in Philly we'd like to keep things very, very practical. So I know we said this was not going to be an educational session, but um, before we move on to the questions, can I ask each one of you to give me uh, your top three pieces of advice if I'm a small moving or small DSP company that has no clue where to start, what should I be focusing on in the short and medium term, for example, if I want to go onto the sustainability path? Uh, I'll start with you, Sebastian, we'll just go down the road again. Start hiring a consultant uh, in order to help you to organize it, uh, construct and develop clear goals and, and measurable, easy goals, educate your people, uh, uh, from the top down all in your uh, floor charge and that's it I, 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 I give <laughs> you more story. space for you um, I think looking at what you're already doing um, there are um, I believe that everybody is doing something they're just not realizing that it might be uh, a greener way of doing things uh, maybe it's for cost efficiency or something else. Um, so look at that. You will find the low hanging fruit within your business that you can, you know, um, capitalize. Yeah, definitely. So, um, but yeah, I agree with Sebastian. It's really about educating, listening, listening to the young people. You, um, you, maybe you have a consultant in your company already. Um, maybe they're super uh, interested in the topic, so they're getting more engaged. Um, there are students that study sustainability now. Why not reach out to them? Um, well, I know we talked about the attendance to this panel, but talk to other companies, talk to other movers, what they're doing. Um, we had a wonderful, I believe he's now with Santa Fe. He was with Bristol last year. Mm -hmm. uh, Dominic, uh, when we had that meeting in Cannes, um, he talked about how Patagonia actually educates um, other companies or their suppliers and how to be greener. So I believe that within this global um, industry, we can learn from each other. And if we're talking to each other, what you're doing in your individual companies, then that's already what you can do. Phil? Well, I think it begins with, uh, does your workforce understand the values of your organization and the purpose of your organization? And if their understanding is only it's about making money for the benefit of the shareholders, um, yeah, you're going to lose a lot of folks uh, and because they aren't engaged. So uh, I think you have to have a clarity of purpose and values. And with that, you have to have an empowering and encouraging environment to say, hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is what our purpose, this is what we're trying to accomplish. Sustainability is also financial sustainability, but um, we have a role and a purpose to help make this a world a better place. And then with that being said, with the empowerment going forward saying, okay, now what can each of us do in our own lives, within our own teams, within our own offices that generally are aligning with outcomes that are benevolent? And they may proceed at different paces, but um, again, it just it looks different in different locations, but let the people run with the things that they're passionate about, and then that drives a certain energy in the organization that hopefully collectively you're moving the needles on, on a variety of different fronts. Yeah, I'd agree for uh, the context of a smaller moving company or DSP, I think the, the answer lies in the people uh, and, and creating that environment to encourage them to come forward and talk about suggestions they might have around how uh, the company or, or their individual actions um, can, can drive a green agenda. So I, I think you'll be surprised at the passion and energy that people have about this subject 
even within your own organization. And if you can then make it part of the fabric of meetings or town halls where it's on the agenda and it's talked about, then I think you'll be surprised at the energy and passion that individuals have uh, to, to make this uh, drive forward. So I think, again, in the context of a small company, I, th I think you're going to find a lot of the answers are already within your, 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 your people. I'm going to echo that. Um, with very small DSPs, a lot of them work with consultants who go out on the road looking for houses, talk to them, find out what they feel, find out what they drive, you know. Um, the other thing, of course, is, as has been said, education. Both FIDI and Eura have educational programs uh, that you can sit and learn about, what, uh, learn about this subject, learn about it. It takes you four hours um, and costs you next to nothing. So at the end of the day, education, um, oh, education and uh, uh, education. I think, I think it got pretty clear what the main uh, focus point should be for any company. I would just echo uh, something that Jessica said before um, about uh, how many companies are already doing a lot without noticing. There was something that really blew my mind when we started working in FIDI on the two reports, which I strongly, strongly recommend that you read. Um, we did, we did a, a whole... Uh, research, a small research project on what does actually mean to be a sustainable mover and we used um, FIDI affiliates around the world to just get some ideas and I was amazed to see how often it was the smallest companies in the most difficult locations that were actually having a real impact. Their problem was that either they were not really aware that it was actually a sustainability thing and they, they didn't know how to communicate that up towards the, or up the food chain in a way. So um, if I could add one more thing is communication is key uh, because if you don't tell your ecosystem what you're doing, well, no one will know. Um, and up the food chain, I would say, we need to find a way of helping these smaller companies uh, clarify or explain what they are doing without killing it by coming with such a format that they don't know how to report or communicate about it. So I think this education is definitely a, a, very, a very important point. Like you said, to your point, people to also find your sustainability champion, whether they are inside or outside of your, of your company. And then definitely uh, communication is, is another key. So with, with, that, with that having been, having been said, I invite anybody who's got a question here to please. So I'll start with Pauline. Uh, then we have uh, I can't Marcel. See. Marcel, thank you. Uh, and then we have Rico um, from Finland. Um, Lou, Lou. <laughs> Mine was not really a question, but it's just to jump on what you just said, Magalie. And I think, you know, I'm an advocate for sustainability and have taken part in, in many sessions and many panels. But at the conference, we can do a lot more. Bill's right that we have um, a very minority uh, membership here in the room. So how do we take the conversation out to the general conference attendees? And, you know, I'm an advocate, but I haven't talked about sustainability in any of my meetings this week. So maybe we need to um, include five minutes in our half hour sessions to talk about what we as companies are doing and sharing that with the people who are not in this room. And one thing that I would like to sort of, I'm going to challenge myself and, and to everyone in this room for the next conference is, instead of bringing a box of business cards, maybe, I'm not saying throw out the ones you already have, but before you go to your next print run on business cards, consider digital cards. Um, and if we, at the next conference, reduce the number of cards we hand out by 20%, that's a small step, as Jessica made a point. And the following conference, 50%. That's a small impact, but it's a big impact for us at a conference um, within the industry. And if we all think of those small things, we will make a difference. And there's also these small That's things so that actually lead to the mindset change because yeah. it, it becomes, it normalizes something that for now people will be like, oh, but that's not important. There's the sustainability, crazy people uh, walking around there. Yeah. So that, that, that's a, that, the, the change of mindset is actually quite important. But maybe just to add, right, um, wonderful idea. FIDI39 Club had that same idea uh, together with the Global Green Initiative that was founded in 2019 between uh, FIDI39 Club, LAGMA Next, and the IMYPs uh, to actually have a QR code on your badge um, so that you don't have to bring your business card. So I hope that we can get this up and running by next week. <laughs> Thank you. Or by I am Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck. Marcel Goslin. Um, 
If you look at the CO2 footprint of a typical moving company, um, and you look at the reports that these consultants you know, give back to you with nice charts and everything, what is really relevant, and that back to the question that is on the board, what is really relevant in terms of CO2 is the transportation, and mainly the air and the road transportation. And to change that, and, and if we want to you know, set priorities and, and do something against the planet that is on fire, then you know, we need to change that. We need to talk group, which we need to talk intermodal. We need to talk air freight allowance. We need to talk um, throwing less things away and buying them again at destination, etc., etc. Then we need to talk transit times. And all of that involves the corporate customers and their policies or the private uh, consumer customers and the education of them. And I get annoyed by the RFPs, and I'm addressing this to Bill and his team to please educate his customers and all of the other RMCs as well, because you have these direct access to the real big the corporate c customers. But the RFPs asks us about printed business cards and less paperwork and all the nitty gritty things that we have talked about and switching off lights and, and whatever else we do. But yet in the same RFP, you, you have this, the firm you know, thing to, to report on short transit times, low price, and the, the allowances of the air freight are in there. They're not changeable for us at that moment anymore. We cannot consult them anymore, and it's there. I think the priority is to really drive the change from the corporate customer onwards, and that's what makes the real difference, um, rather than maybe these little, little, you can start with that as well, but priorities need to shift, I think. Okay. <laughs> Well, no question, Marcel. And, uh, you know, I think there's hope in this equation. <clears throat> the reality is the mobility function is not a key driver of the business effectiveness and winning business from and against their competitors, right? So over time, I do think there is going to be a increasing amount of evaluation deeper and deeper in corporations as they evaluate their scope threes and then they say, what's going on in this segment where we're mobilizing our talent, right? Right now, I, I think there's extreme awareness across every public corporation, but because it's an ocean of opportunity for them, the layer of, of detailed investigation hasn't really yet landed in what are the effects of their mobility program. Um, I know in our instance, Mark, and I'm sure in yours as well, we are trying to help educate them. And you know what's really cool is when you do that, the mobility person goes, whoa. And you know what our job is at the end of the day? Is to get that mobility person promoted because they're bringing ideas and concepts to the table of their leadership that isn't even expected of them at this point in time. And that's where I think our voice, our advocacy, our thought leadership, um, our, our demonstrated um, reporting about our own impacts is a way that we can help bring that conversation to the client and in the process through education, you know, frankly, give them more of a, a legitimate contemporary personal brand. And at the end of the day, hopefully somebody in their organization recognizes that, you know what, this is a really forward thinking person that's leading our mobility program. Um, that's what you got to have hope for. And just to add to that, so within the coalition, I think one, one point that was raised over and over again as well is the importance of the procurement process and that the problem with the procurement process is that you have one person who's maybe never moved in their entire life. So they've got no clue what goes into an international move. So they're just, they're just there to tick the boxes. So it's actually up to us to educate and that's again, this two-way education. It's up to us to educate the clients as well as to what goes into an international move, what goes into or the efforts that we as in down the supply chain have to do to, um, to comply with their request so that they can comply with their legislation. And then at one point say, okay, so actually, you know what? We really are in this together. So we need to tackle this problem together. It can't just be us ticking boxes and, and bow, bowing down to something that has been done the way they've always done. And another thing that we are truly, truly lacking is data. Because it is true that right now everybody's pointing, pointing at the movers because, oh, you've got the bad trucks and, oh, you've got the packing material and the air shipment. 
But what about in the entire global mobility process? What about all those uh, home flights three times per year uh, for a family of five? Uh, how does the carbon footprint of that compare with a 20-foot container that goes by sea uh, from, I don't know, Belgium to Singapore? So it is also, that's one of the, one of the big, big, I think short-term priorities of what we are doing here is also figuring out what we're actually working with so that we can create this awareness of what the reality of the whole thing actually looks like, right? I think Miko, you had a question. Yeah, hi, Miko from Alpha Mobility. So I have a more of a theoretical question to the companies on, on stage. So um, let's say I'm already living in 2030 and I come to you today and say, look, I'm Ecobody's Platinum, I'm carbon negative, I tick all the boxes on your own roadmaps. Should I assume that I can also charge you two, three, four times the, the market average for, for that service and also assume my calendar would be fully booked? And if not, why? Well, you can assume what you like. It might not get you the money or the business. Because I think ultimately, to Marcel's point, this is going to come back to the customer base. And the customer base, whether it's an individual that's being relocated or choosing to move or a company. And our experience in the US is that that is still not a consistent view. It's uh, different businesses. The oil, energy, gas sector has a very different view on green initiatives within the RFPs that we see compared to the financial or legal sector. So 2030, you know, is that a moment in time where we could assume that it's fully embedded in the way we think about how the world works? In your part of the world, I would suggest you're probably at the most advanced forefront of how companies think about that. If you're dealing with the National Bank of Thailand, I wonder if they're in the same space in 2030. So I don't, I, I, and I respect the fact you're, you're saying this in English, assume might not be the right way of positioning this. I think having the conversation, having the courage of your convictions, standing up for what you believe to be right in your environment, I applaud that 100%. But I don't think you can assume that you're going to be able to charge more for that. One more question, I think. Okay. One more question and then Chuck. Um, just, just a question. How do we, as associations, prevent the middle layer, which is going to add an enormous cost to this? So there are already people, businesses involved, who are not going to provide any service to us. All they're going to do is add a layer of cost. How do we make sure this doesn't add that layer to our people? And that in itself is unsustainable because it's going to affect their ability to pay employees to do things meaningful to affect the environment? That is the big question. One just second. just tell me, help me understand what the layer is you're referring to? So, so the layer of consultants, so the consultant layer. So, so the green industry will build an enormous layer of industry whose sole job is to manage the green industry. Those people aren't going to produce anything, they're not going to lower any carbon footprints, they're not going to do anything. They're just going to add cost. How do we as associations help our smaller members? And I'm sorry, Sebastian, you said go and get a consultant. Well, a two company, two person company is going to struggle to do that, and that is the layer that I'm speaking about. We need to, as associations, we need to help our members mitigate that layer. Well, I think, uh, if I may, uh, that's the, the purpose of the coalition uh, is to, you know, both from the bottom up and the top down. Um, create the framework that's a, a, a global framework that we all agree to, to operate within, set the standards, understand and agree on what the measurement criteria is to report uh, uh, on the various you know, data points that you're going to need to be able to push them back to your customers and to, to the, the association members as a whole. So I think that if we, if we weren't sitting here talking about a coalition, I'd be very worried about that. But my hope is that the momentum that we've got through the coalition and the organizations that are represented here, we're able to get out in front of that and we won't need a consulting layer to come and tell us what to do because we'll have created it ourselves. And we use that as the, the message that we take back to our customers. And, and I think for, you know, back to this point and to 
the one that Bill made earlier. We, we as this room, we need to go out <laughs> at the end of this session, talk to the people uh, over lunch about how important it is that they are participating and driving this too. Because we, you know, FIDI can't do this without a mandate from its members. Uh, and, and the worldwide ERC can't do this without a mandate from our membership. So it's important that this is both from the bottom up and the top down, but I do think I have ultimate confidence that the coalition will get us there. I do like the work. If, you, if you've looked at any of the documentation that's come out, Deloitte, I think, are absolutely the right partner for us in, in, in the work I've seen, at least. And I think that will drive us to a point where we won't need to allow this layer of consultants to come in and create an extra cost to, to all of our businesses. Chuck. I, I, I agree with you, Bill. I, I, I do. It, it is a concern that's been echoed to me by many of our members, particularly those medium to small, that are having to compete with entities on ROPs that are asking for information and data that they just necessarily either can't provide or must go through another entity to provide. I, I, with Mr. Birchall as well, though, I think that there is an opportunity for this coalition to be able to provide more information more easily to make you have the ability to attain your baseline information moving forward without, without huge cost. At, at least I, I had my fingers crossed. The thing I think we also need to understand is the consumer is changing and what the consumer is looking for and what their wants and needs and their ability to choose can be based on your sustainability initiatives. And so I think we're gonna to have to meet the needs of the consumer and then I'd go back to, to Bill and you're talking to your customers, they have to realize that those that are purchasing the products and services and whatever are looking at this from a very different perspective than maybe what has, has been done in the past. And, and doing good can pay. And so I, I, I think this is something we're all gonna have to embrace. It, it, if we don't, we're gonna be left on the side. So do we have to budget for it? Do we have to consider? Do we need to act? 100% we do. I think our coalition will help in that process. But but we're all going to have to, I believe, fully understand that this is the future or we have no future. Thank you, Chuck. Chuck, so I might just jump in and, you know, 100 years ago, the public accountancy industry did not have <clears throat> a universally or at least, you know, US-based standard adopted such as GAAP, okay? So uh, at, prior to that, you know, if you ran a business, you hired a local accountant, they would evaluate your books, but they could inter interpret the legitimacy of your bookkeeping and records um, and, and financial health. Uh, but it could be interpreted entirely different across town with another accountant or across the country with a different accountant. And so GAP ultimately, through the uh, engagement of a variety of accountants that were thinking in terms of best practices, though that association came together and created a standard. Unfortunately, where we sit here today is there are so many moving targets and there are so many definitions of what should be accomplished, and that goes back to the glossary, which will be helpful. And that's where I believe, while the SEC is now getting more and more and more defined in terms of what public corporations have to report from a sustainability ESG point of view and what defines goodness in the modern world of investing, okay, there's going to be a parallel path here that is going to lay those groundworks of rules for us. So we don't necessarily have to create them in their totality, but what we can do is have a forefront effort to say, hey, we are the subject matter experts of this very global industry, and these are the impacts that we have identified and measured, and therefore these are the recommendations as you're looking to create consistency in reporting so it can be authenticated and investors can have confidence that the corporations that are creating emissions are doing so in the most conscientious, legitimized, accurate method possible. So Amen. follow the steps <laughs> of the, the coalition and we will be serving ourselves well, I believe, over the uh, course of time 
influencing what become the global standards. And then as businesses, you're going to have to make a choice. And are you going to play in that traffic or are you going to play on the fringes? And there will always be an ability to run a business playing on the fringes. You compete against them every day. You know, companies that don't do routine maintenance, companies that don't uh, file driver logs, whatever the case may be, companies that don't pay taxes, companies that don't have licenses, right? We're always going to be competing against fringe players. But I believe those who choose to associate with FIDI or ERC or CHPA or whatever the case might be, those are the legitimate business leaders and I think this is going to be a really helpful journey for all of us who really care. Thank you very much, Bill. So after those very positive words, I can see my, my colleagues are getting really nervous in the background. I'll just close this session off with, I could go on for hours and hours talking about this, so you can find me somewhere close to the coffee machine out later. Um, I will end this with a big, big, big call to action. Uh, as Bill said and as, as Tad also mentioned, uh, we as membership associations can only do what our members mandate us to do and we can only do that if we can lean on our members. So we will need all the help we can get because now, now we need to start with the legwork. So we've identified a series of working groups which we will be announcing very soon. We need all the volunteers we can, even if you don't really know what we're talking about, it doesn't matter because you are, sub like you said, experts in your specific field and that's what we need so myself for example i'm looking at you for the rfp working group for example um but there is a lot of work and i need all the help we need all the help we can get to really drive this forward now that we really have this momentum growing we need to use it to actually start having a meaningful impact so i am looking at all of you for that work Yeah, but very, very quick, Susie. Yes. I have a very loud voice, I know that. It's two things up to the one. Um, I'm very surprised that nobody's talking about the Chambers of Commerce. Because all over the world, the Chambers of Commerce are working on this. You don't really need to invent the wheel, do you? You can just give it to them. Because most of us are members and our customers as well. So they have, at, at least in Europe, what I know, I don't know how it is in the US. Thank you. Um, they, um, no, 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 use it, use it. <laughs> um, no, but the Chamber of Commerce, and they, at least what I know in Europe, they all have sustainability groups installed already, and some of the Chambers of Commerce even have vice presidents already taking care of this, and it's really customers and us involved in the same thing. So I think everybody should go back and talk to them. That's actually a very good point, and that's back to Phil's point um, on, on avoiding to creating this level of consultants or level of financial resources that we maybe don't have. But there are, like you said, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, there are lots. I'm very sorry, we really need to finish off now uh, because we have the General yeah. Assembly coming, so I do, uh, I do invite you to stay sitting because the General Assembly is a very, very important moment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I do invite you to continue this conversation with us around the coffee machine uh, at the gala dinner. Uh, I think I, I can speak for all of us. We can get really, really passionate about the subject, so I do invite you to join us later for, for the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you.